In this video, we are going to look at how to check if there is data that is ready to be read on a socket. And more specifically, we're going to do this on our listening socket because when there is data to be read on a listening socket, that indicates that there is someone trying to connect. In order to pull a socket to check for events, we will use something called WSA pull. In a Linux environment, this uh, function is just called Poll. For WSA poll, there are a few arguments. The first argument is a pointer to an array of WSA poll FD structs. The next argument is the number of elements in that array that we passed in. And the last argument is the timeout in milliseconds. In order for us to pass in the pointer to our array, we're going to create a struct to use. And this is going to be for our listening socket. FD stands for file descriptor, mainly because in Linux, everything is like a file descriptor, like for our sockets. So I guess Windows just chose to use that name for it. When we call WSA poll, we're going to pass in the address of our listening socket file descriptor. Since we only have one file descriptor, we're just going to pass in one. And for our timeout, we're going to pass in one just so it'll wait at least one millisecond. What this means is we could have it wait for at least one millisecond when checking if there is data to be read. We could use zero, but it kind of beats up the processor, so I prefer not to use zero here. So we've set up this WSA poll FD struct. However, it is not in any way linked to our listening socket. If we look at the WSA poll FD struct, we'll see that it contains our socket handle, and it contains something called events and something called R events. Events is the events that we want to check for. R events are the events that will be sent back from when we call WSA poll. We'll look at the documentation in just a moment to get some clarity on this. But first, let's go back. And we know that the file descriptor is going to be our socket handle. So we'll set the FD equal to listening socket and we will get the handle. Next, we need to set the events and R events. We're going to set these both to zero, and then I'm going to pull up the documentation to determine what we have to change. The way it works is the event is a status being requested, and it can be multiple of these ORed together. Now, for priority data, it says it's not even supported by Microsoft Winsock, so we don't care about it. For out-of-band data, we're not doing out-of-band data, so I don't care about it. So the only two that we care about are poll read norm and poll write norm. And this is saying if normal data can be read without blocking or normal data can be written without blocking. We're never going to be writing to our listening socket. We're only going to be checking if there are incoming connections from our listening socket which can be triggered but if we just check for normal data can be read without blocking. Because of this, we know that the events that we're going to be checking for for our listening socket are going to be poll read norm. Now let's take a look at the R events. The R events will be set when we call the WSA poll function call. So the idea is you pass in an array of file descriptors in there with the events you want to check for and then Inside of that array for the R events, that value will get filled to one of these or not changed at all if there is no uh, events set from WSA poll. And then you will check them before you do any operation on that socket. Of course, you can see we have pull error if an error occurs, pull hang up if just something went wrong with the stream. If either of these occurred on an actual connection socket, we would close that socket. Pull inval if an invalid socket was used. This should never happen because we should not be using invalid sockets, but we might check for that as well just in case that happens and just remove it from the connection list. Pull pry for priority data. We are not going to be using priority data, so I don't care about that. We're not going to be using out of band data, so I don't care about that. This, of course, is pull read norm and pull write norm, which are the two. Big ones we care about for knowing whether we can read or write to a socket. And just for the listening socket, like I said, all we care about is if we can read data. 
One last thing is let's take a look back at WSA poll and see what this function will return. We'll see that it returns zero if none of the sockets were in the queried state that we're checking for before the timer expired. Greater than zero will mean at least one socket in the array had some event that we were checking for. And then socket error, of course, is socket error. One last thing to note before we go back to the code is I had used a value greater than zero when I called poll for the timeout. So I would just wait for one millisecond to not beat up my CPU too much. Zero would return immediately and less than zero would wait indefinitely. So if you pass in less than zero, it would be blocking. This has uses for if you're designing something like a chat application and you don't need any kind of events to constantly be going while the server is running. And what we're going to do is we're going to have an if statement when we call WSA poll. And if it's greater than zero, that means that there is at least one file descriptor that we're querying that had the events that we're checking for. So in order to check if it was our listening socket file descriptor, which we know that it was because it was the only one that we passed in, but later on we'll be passing in an array, so we'll have to check each individual one. We would do if listening socket file descriptor, and we look at the R events, and we want to check for poll read norm. So we would and it with poll read norm. And if this evaluates to true, then that means that this event was flagged. So at this point, we are ready to attempt to accept the connection. So we'll go down to where we have our connection. We're going to cut that, paste it up here. So we have our socket new connection. And we're going to keep the same logic for now, where after we accept the connection, we just close it instantly. And then otherwise, we print out failed to accept new connection if something went wrong there. What we'll do is let's first go ahead and run the server. And there's two things you'll see. First off, the CPU usage is much lower. It's, it's saying 0%, but obviously that's not possible. But we're not getting spammed with the messages because no events have been flagged on a listening socket. And now when we run the client, the client is still able to continue just fine. In our server, you see we got the new connection accepted. That is going to conclude this video. In the next video, we are going to set up a TCP connection class that will contain things like the socket to the connection, as well as other information that will be tied to that individual connection.